So the Spear Danes, in days gone by, and the kings who ruled them had courage and greatness. We have heard of those princes' heroic campaigns. There was Shield Chiefson, scourge of many tribes, a wrecker of mead benches rampaging among foes. The terror, this terror of the Hall troops had come far. A foundling to start with, he would flourish later on, as his powers waxed and his worth was proved. In the end, each clan on the outlying coast beyond the whale road had to yield to him and begin to pay tribute. That was one good king. Afterward, a boy child was born to shield, a cub in the yard, a comfort sent by God to that nation. He knew what they had told, the long times and troubles they'd come through without a leader. So the Lord of Life, the glorious Almighty, made this man renowned. Shield had fathered a famous son. Biao's name was known through the north, and a young prince must be prudent like that, giving freely while his father lives, so that afterward, in age when fighting starts, steadfast companions will stand by him and hold the line. Behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. Shield was still thriving when his time came and he crossed over into the Lord's keeping. His warrior band did what he bade them. When he laid down the law among the Danes, they shouldered him out to the sea's flood. The chief they revered, who had long ruled them. A ring-warled prow rode in the harbor, ice-clad, outbound, a craft for a prince. They stretched their beloved lord in his boat, laid out by the mast. Amidships, the great ring-giver. Far-fetched treasures were piled upon him, and precious gear. I never heard before of a ship so well furbished with battle tackle, bladed weapons, and coats of mail. The massed treasure was loaded on top of him. It would travel far on out into the ocean's sway. They decked his body no less bountifully with offerings than those first ones did who cast him away when he was a child and launched him alone out over the waves, and they set a gold standard up high above his head and let him drift to wind and tide, bewailing him and mourning their loss. No man can tell, no wise man in hall or weathered veteran knows for certain who salvaged that load. Then it fell to Biao to keep the forts. He was well regarded and ruled the Danes for a long time after his father took leave of, the, of his life on earth. And then his heir, the great half-Dane, held sway. For as long as he lived, their elder and warlord, he was four times a father, this fighter prince. One by one they entered the world, Herogar, Hrothgar, the good Halga, and a daughter, I have heard, who was Anelia's queen, a balm in bed to the battle-scarred Swede. The fortunes of war favored Hrothgar. Friends and kinsmen flocked to his ranks, young followers, a force that grew to be a mighty army. So his mind turned to hall-building. He handed down orders for men to work on a great mead hall, meant to be a wonder of the world forever. It would be his throne room, and there he would dispense his God-given goods to young and old, but not the common land or people's lives. Far and wide through the world I have heard orders for work to adorn that wallstead were sent to many peoples, and soon it stood there finished and ready in full view, the Hall of Halls. Heroat was the name. He had settled on it, whose utterance was law. Nor did he renege, but doled out rings and torques at the table. The hall towered its gables wide and high and awaiting a barbarous burning. That doom abided, but in time it would come, the killer instinct unleashed among in-laws, the bloodlust rampant. Then, a powerful demon, a prowler through the dark, nursed a hard grievance. It harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet every day in the hall, the harp being struck, and the clear song of a skilled poet, telling with mastery of man's beginnings. How the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girdled with waters. In his splendor he set the sun and the moon to be earth's lamplight, lanterns for men, and filled the broad lap of the world with branches and leaves and quickened life in every other thing that moved. 
So times were pleasant for the people there until finally one, a fiend out of hell, began to work his evil in the world. Grendel was the name of this grim demon haunting the marshes, marauding round the heath and the desolate fens. He had dwelt for a time in misery among the banished monsters, Cain's clan, whom the Creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts. For the killing of Abel, the Eternal Lord had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder, because the Almighty made him anathema, and out of the curse of his exile... There sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms, and the giants, too, who strove with God, time and again until he gave them their reward. So after nightfall, Grendel set out for the lofty house to see how the Ring Danes were settling into it after their drink, and there he came upon them, a company of the best asleep from their feasting, insensible to pain and human sorrow. Suddenly then the god-cursed brute was creating havoc. Greedy and grim, he grabbed thirty men from their resting places and rushed to his lair, flushed up and inflamed from the raid, blundering back with the butchered corpses. Then, as dawn brightened and the day broke, Grendel's powers of destruction were plain. Their waysail was over, they wept to heaven and mourned under mourning. Their mighty prince, their storied leader, sat stricken and helpless, humiliated by the loss of his guard, bewildered and stunned, staring aghast at the demon's trail in deep distress. He was numb with grief, but got no respite, for one night later merciless Grendel struck again with more gruesome murders. Malignant by nature, he never showed remorse. It was easy then to meet with a man shifting himself to a safer distance to bed in the bothies, for who could be blind to the evidence of his eyes, the obviousness of the hall watcher's hate? Whoever escaped kept a weather eye open and moved away. So Grendel ruled in defiance of right, one against all, until the greatest house in the world stood empty, a deserted wallstead. For twelve winters, seasons of woe, the lord of the shielding suffered under his load of sorrow. And so, before long, the news was no known over the whole world. Sad lays were sung about the beset king, the vicious raids and ravages of Grendel, his long and unrelenting feud nothing but war how he would never parley or, or make peace with any dane nor stop his death dealing nor pay the death price no counselor could ever expect fair reparation from those rabid hands all were endangered, young and old were hunted down by that dark death shadow who lurked and swooped in the long nights on the misty moors. Nobody knows where these reavers from hell roam on their errands, so Grendel waged his lonely war, inflicting constant cruelties on the people, atrocious hurt. He took over Herod, haunted the glittering hall after dark, but the throne itself, the treasure seat, he was kept from approaching. He was the Lord's outcast. These were hard times, heartbreaking for the prince of the shieldings. Powerful counselors, the highest in the land, would lend advice, plotting how best the bold defenders might resist and beat off sudden attacks. Sometimes at pagan shrines, they vowed offerings to idols, swore oaths that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save the people. That was their way, their heathenish hope. Deep in their hearts, they remembered hell. The almighty judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, head of the heavens and high king of the world, was unknown to them. O oh, cursed is he who in time of trouble has to thrust his soul into the fire's embrace, forfeiting help. He has nowhere to turn. But blessed is he who after death can approach the Lord and find friendship in the Father's embrace. So that troubled time continued. Woe that never stopped. Steady affliction for half Dane's son. Too hard an ordeal. There was panic after dark. People endured raids in the night, riven by the terror. <laughs>